straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. The jury for the murder trial of Derek Chauvin is filling up as the judge rules it will move forward. Plus, the jury will now hear evidence of George Floyd's prior arrest. How police body cam video could impact the trial. Clearly, there's a cause of death issue here. In fact, it is highly contested. And we look into the so-called army of prosecutors versus one defense attorney. But is it as it appears? You gotta be lean and mean. Everything you need to know about the Derek Chauvin trial on this special edition of Law & Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law & Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. The jury is nearly complete for the trial of Derek Chauvin. Law & Crime's Kim Johnson is in Minneapolis for us and has the latest on jury selection for the first former officer charged with murdering George Floyd to stand trial. Brian, the trial of Derek Chauvin will stay in Hennepin County and will start on time. Judge Peter Cahill had denied the defense's request to move this trial outside of this county into a different county in light of a highly publicized announcement last week of a settlement between the city of Minneapolis and George Floyd's family. Judge Cahill said that he didn't think there was a place in Minnesota that hasn't been exposed to extreme publicity. The judge also denied delaying the start of trial, saying publicity would continue with or without a delay. Another development, the judge approved a 13th juror. She is a white woman in her 50s, is passionate about homeless issues and affordable housing, but said she doesn't hold any resentment for police's handling of homeless camp encampments. She, here she is uh, being questioned on police interactions. Would you go as far as to say that if you... Um, re resist the police or don't cooperate with the police and you get harmed as a result, you kind of get what you have coming to you. I don't know. It, you know, it depends on the situation. I don't, if you're not listening to what the commands are, obviously something else needs to happen to resolve the situation. So I don't know how far the steps would go. It would depend on what the situation is. Because Derek Chauvin is white and George Floyd was black, the racial makeup of the jury is getting a lot of attention. Seven members of the jury are white, six identify as people of color. Eight women make up the jury, five are men, and only one juror left to go. But no matter how quickly this jury is formed, Judge Cahill has said over and over again that opening statements, the beginning of this trial, won't begin any earlier than March 29th. Brian? Thanks, Kim. Joining us today is a famed criminal defense attorney who's no stranger to picking a jury in a high-profile case, Mark Garagos. Uh, Mark, let's say you're the defense attorney in this case. How do you feel about the 13 jurors so far and the fact that you're only going to have two alternates? Uh, look, I think so far um, the jury is set up as a hung jury. I, I don't see a verdict in this case, given what I've seen so far. Now, we, uh, the caveat to that is we lost a couple of jurors in the, the last week due to the announcement of the $27 million settlement, which I think irritated the judge in this case and uh, the defense. But so far, the defense, to my mind, I don't think they ever expected to get an acquittal. And I think they're engineering this case for a hung jury. And so far, I think they're headed for that in that direction. I would agree with you. But let's bring in co-host Terry Austin. Terry... Some of the jurors uh, the prosecutors kept on were, were shocking. I mean, we just heard one. I'm thinking of the juror who said, uh, like we just said, if something goes wrong because you don't comply, then that might be how life ends up for you. Uh, what did you make of that juror making it to the, to the panel? You know, Brian, sometimes attorneys have to accept jurors, even if they express opinions that are contrary to what your client might want them to say. So I think you're referring to juror number nine. She's a working mom. She agreed with the statement that if you don't cooperate with the police, then if something happens, then you have yourself to blame. And clearly, if you are the attorney trying to prosecute Chauvin for using unnecessary force, you may not want that juror on the case because she might just very well defend Chauvin's actions. But I think ultimately she said that the criminal justice system is not perfect and there's room for improvement. So maybe the prosecution decided to take a chance in the hopes that she'd try to improve the system by holding Chauvin accountable for his actions. 
Mark, I totally get that. I'm a practicing public defender in Brooklyn. You never get the juror, the perfect juror. You, you've always sometimes got to settle with something in between. But both sides still had peremptory challenges. Do you think either should have maybe used one of those challenges for a now seated juror? Do you think one of them should have been kicked out? Well, following up on what Terry said, it's really more jury deselection. But there is a, uh, there is a what I would consider a more overriding um, analysis you have to do. You, there are, uh, I always say, or I used to say, that there are leaders and followers, goats and sheep. Um, you have to understand who's going to drive a verdict. The verdict, uh, you can look at each individual juror and you can always second guess yourself. But what you need to is you want to keep on who's going to be the person who drives your verdict or the person who's going to stand their ground. That's what, that's infinitely more important. In this case, I don't think the defense, they'll never admit it, are, uh, expects they're not guilty. So yep. what they're looking for are jurors who are going to stand their ground. It's Friday Absolutely. at 3 o'clock. They've been deliberating for th uh, three days, and they're not going to change their verdict just because somebody says you have to come back on Monday. I would agree, Mark. And we'll keep an eye on the jury selection because we still got one left. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily. More on that $27 million settlement that the George Floyd's family and other police misconduct settlements like it. But first, the judge said it wasn't coming in, but has now decided the jury will see the 2019 arrest of George The judge in the trial of Derek Chauvin deals a win to the defense by allowing them to show the jury parts of an old arrest of George Floyd. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with why the jury will see only parts of the video. Yeah, Brian, Judge Cahill had actually ruled last year that this 2019 arrest video was out. But now he's decided that the jurors could see portions of it that could help them answer one of the central questions in this case, and that is what caused the death of George Floyd. Keep your hands where I can can see them. On May 6, 2019, Minneapolis police pulled over a car in which George Floyd was a passenger. On May 25th, 2020, the date of Mr. Floyd's death, there is uh, a very similar starting situation. Derek Chauvin's attorneys have argued the similarities are so striking that the jury should see the video. Open your mouth, spit out what you got. That's just one of the similarities. You can see pills in Floyd's mouth in screen grabs of the May 2020 arrest video. Judge Cahill has ruled the jury will be allowed to see only portions of that 2019 body camera footage. What is relevant in the May 6, 2019 case that goes to cause of death or medical condition is essentially the video of the body-worn camera would be admissible from the time that the one officer approaches Mr. Floyd on the passenger side of the vehicle, the subsequent behavior with regard to eating drugs or not. Judge Cahill says there are plenty of portions of the May 2019 arrest that are not admissible, meaning it's improper for the jury to see. Mr. Floyd's emotional behavior, calling out for his mother, all that is not admissible. During that 2019 arrest, a paramedic treated George Floyd. Cahill ruled that the jury won't see that video, but that the paramedic can testify about specific parts of her interaction with George Floyd. The paramedic can explain her actions in uh, recommending to Mr. Floyd to go to the hospital. The state had objected to the jury seeing any of that arrest video, claiming it was irrelevant because Floyd's death was caused by Chauvin and the other officers, not the fentanyl in Floyd's system. Famed forensic pathologist Dr. Cyril Wecht agrees with that conclusion. Someone who is going to die uh, from an overdose of fentanyl, just like with morphine or heroin, um, is not going to be uh, aggressive in a physical sense, in a, um, a vocal, a verbal sense. But ultimately, the jury will make that determination. Clearly, there's a cause of death issue here. In fact, it is highly contested. Now, Judge Case Hill also ruled that a forensic psychiatrist hired by the prosecution will not be allowed to testify about George Floyd's state of mind in the minutes before he passed away, whether that has to do with him suffering from a panic attack, some sort of claustrophobia, or PTSD. 
But the judge said that the door, if the defense opens the door to that type of testimony, the issue could be revisited so that psychiatrists could eventually be allowed to testify in rebuttal if the defense opens the door. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. Here to discuss the ruling on the 2019 arrest is criminal defense attorney Mark Garrigus and Terry Austin. Mark, I'm not sure if this tactically helps the defense. Both arrests show Floyd taking drugs. Uh, he only dies when a knee is pressed on his neck for eight minutes or more. Doesn't that suggest that the knee killed him? I, you know, it's amazing that you would say that because I've been talking to people this morning and saying the exact same thing. Uh, I don't know that this is kind of the old expression, be careful what you wish for. He looks compliant. He, uh, to somebody who is disposed to the uh, defense, I'm not sure this necessarily helps. Uh, it gives you an argument. And the, the one thing that I would say is, remember, there is a federal grand jury behind this or lurking in the background. One of the biggest decisions that the defense is going to have to make is, do we put Chauvin on the stand? This video, they may be calculating that this video helps them not have to put Chauvin on the stand and be able to make their defense argument without him. Because remember, if he takes the stand and it's a hung jury, the feds can come in and indict him and use what he says. Exactly. Terry, if the argument is that Floyd always does this when he's arrested, but Chauvin didn't know that, aren't we just putting Chauvin's character on trial? Well, yes. And oftentimes when, you know, you try to put in drug use, you're trying to show that the victim is to blame here. But what the judge is saying is he thinks it's relevant because cause of death and medical evidence are so closely related here. And it's such a huge issue. He thinks it should be admitted. I actually think that, you know, it's not more probative. I think it's prejudicial. And having said that, I think it's going to be very difficult to just show part of this video because the jury's going to want to know what happened before that. Exactly. Now, Angela, the judge said there's a way the jury could end up seeing the entire 2019 video. Can you explain? Yeah, the judge said if uh, that forensic psychiatrist does eventually end up testifying about George Floyd's state of mind, then the 2019 video, the entire video has to come in and then the t forensic psychiatrist would have to then offer the, um, his or her thoughts on that whole video. All right, so this is just the initial ruling, but we'll see how this plays out, this 2019 arrest being played for the jury. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, a behind-the-scenes look. Welcome back. The city of Minneapolis is agreeing to pay George Floyd's family $27 million to settle a wrongful death case. But as Chief Investigative Correspondent Brian Ross tells us, that's far from the only such settlement that the city council and other cities have reached around the country. Persons on their stomachs can't breathe with pressure applied to their backs. As soon as suspects are handcuffed, get them off their stomachs. Turn this video was produced by the New York City Police Department in 2003, showing the dangers of the knee-to-neck restraint technique. The video was widely circulated to police departments around the country, including to Minneapolis. It really had a simple message that as soon as a prone suspect is handcuffed, get him off his stomach. And yet, it was still being used in Minneapolis by Derek Chauvin. It was still being used in Minneapolis. It's still being used in cities around the country. Reporter A.J. Legault of Minneapolis TV station CARE 11 found the technique has left a long trail of deaths. We know of at least 107 deaths that followed prone restraint since 2010. There are likely many more. He was on the ground for too long with his hand handcuffed with his hands behind his back with too many police officers on top of him and the care 11 report found that more than half the deaths involved people battling mental illness david smith committed no crime but he battled mental illness and his behavior at the downtown ymca in 2010 raised red flags for staff and the police were called okay, you get it. You get it. it escalated to a struggle ending with officers kneeling on David's back for about four minutes. His autopsy shows he died due to mechanical asphyxia caused by prone restraint. David's family thought police would learn from his death. When my brother died, 
And we fought and fought to show how dangerous this position was. After David Smith died, his family filed a lawsuit. Um, they sued, and in 2013, Minneapolis paid out one of the biggest police misconduct lawsuit settlements at the time in the city's history. And as part of that settlement, the city of Minneapolis agreed to require its sworn police officers, every one of them, to undergo training on positional asphyxia. And it turned out part of the training was playing that NYPD video showing the dangers of the technique and the importance of getting the suspect on his side. When George Floyd died and you see the cell phone video that's gone around the world, you see some of that and you can hear some of the younger officers that have only been on the job about a week asking, hey, should we get him on his side? Hey, should we roll him on his side? Roll him on his side. And Officer Chauvin, who was a training officer and the senior officer there, says no. So naturally, when George Floyd died, we began asking that question. What happened to that promised training? And that's no small point. It's likely going to be a key piece of evidence in the uh, officer's murder trial that they had been trained to get off the back of someone after they had them in custody. Interesting take. When we come back, is Eric Nelson. Welcome back. If you've been watching jury selection and Derek Chauvin's trial, you may have noticed the defense appears to be outnumbered when it comes to lawyers. Anjanette Levy is here to tell us why that might not necessarily be the case. Brian, by our count, the state has 11 prosecutors, some of them working pro bono on this case, while the defense has one attorney and his assistant. But we found out in this case that it turns out the, that appearances could be deceiving. So, ma'am, let's assume you and I were to meet under much different circumstances, a party or some sort of social or networking event, whatever it may be, and I, uh, you and I have our first conversation. Um, what are a couple of things that I learn about you during that casual conversation? Derek Chauvin's defense attorney, Eric Nelson, works for one of the largest law firms in Minnesota, but each day he appears in court alone. Judge Cahill noted the imbalance between prosecution and defense at the end of court Thursday. The state has a lot of lawyers on this case who can sit outside this courtroom and start grinding out things. Mr. Nelson does not, he has, does not have the same level of support. The comments came after special prosecutor Steve Slisher claimed Nelson made an incorrect statement about a press conference held by the city that afternoon in which reporters pressed city officials about their decision to announce a civil settlement with George Floyd's family when jury selection for Chauvin's trial was underway. The prosecutor said Nelson needed to put his concerns in writing. How many lawyers now are admitted pro hoc BJ and are working for the state on this case so far, Mr. Slisher? Is it 10, 12? I, I don't have that number, Your Honor, but I do know that the police federation, the union is funding uh, the defendant's defense. That's not exactly true. The union for Minneapolis police officers, the Minneapolis Police Federation, is not footing the bill for Chauvin's defense. But the Legal Defense Fund for a statewide organization, the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association, is paying the bill. So does the prosecution have too many lawyers? The old phrase, too many chefs spoil the broth. Former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi says the prosecution's army of attorneys could be a recipe for disaster. When you have that, you can't move with alacrity. You can't move with precision because you have too many people in the room trying to make a decision. But Nelson isn't necessarily alone, despite appearances. The head of the MPPOA told the Associated Press that Nelson is one of 12 lawyers in the union's rotation, and he is consulting with them and experts the union uses. I contacted the Minnesota Attorney General's office and asked why the prosecution team needed so many lawyers. So far, there's been no response. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. Mark, so Nelson isn't alone. Do you think him showing up alone is a way to make this case look like a David and Goliath situation? Seems like a smart move. It's a brilliant move, I, if I do say so, because I've done it myself. In fact, I had a federal trial about 12 years ago where I just planted myself as the lone defense lawyer 
and the prosecution, the U.S. Attorney's Office, had four people on the other side. I used to call them the gang of four. And they finally, <laughs> after I kept calling them the gang of four, complained to the judge. And he said, well, you are four. What's your problem? <laughs> Mark, don't give away too many of your secrets now. Terry, with so <laughs> many pro bono prosecutors, does it seem like uh, this could maybe help uh, Chauvin by making him look like the little guy here? You know, that's a really good point, Brian. And maybe the prosecution should only bring a couple of the, you know, attorneys who are helping them instead of bringing everybody in. Because even the judge, as you saw there, noticed how large that team was. But I think more important than the number of attorneys is their character. I think that Eric Nelson has been genuine, and that's coming across to the jury, and they probably appreciate that. Absolutely. Be sure to tune into Law and Crime Network for gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Derek Chauvin's trial. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.